Brooke in Palco, Kansas. Hey, Brooke, what's on your mind today? I, yeah, I just wanted to talk to you about the uh, Kansas legislation, about the gun control laws that they passed. Mm-hmm. You mean uh, arming teachers that the insurance companies are yeah, now saying? Ah, not so much. That's correct. Yeah. So they actually are not going to arm the teachers. The teachers have the right to make that decision on their own, whether they will carry. They will not advertise that they're carrying. It is a concealed right. carry. Yeah, no, I understand so that. So, the stu- yeah, the students themselves, I it will not know which car- uh, teacher is carrying or not. Yeah, now, if we were able to steal Mr. Clark's condom, I think that we could have gotten his gun if he had one. Um, you know, I'm I'm going to say that I uh, support the law. I support the law because I believe that uh, it, most Kansans do. You know, mm. they are very conservative out there. Most of the teachers are avid gun owners and hunters themselves. Yeah. Um, including my sister-in-law, who is a teacher in Palco, Kansas, or was, anyway. <laughs> she decided to take a uh, business route with a master's degree in business. Mm-hmm. But my point is is that arming teachers is not going to come to the harm of the students. Teachers are put there for a reason. You know, if they're uh, not of sound mind, they're going to start stu- shooting students. They shouldn't be a teacher anyway. You know, all teachers get angry, but... It should be up to the principal of whether or which teachers can carry and can't. You know, like, you know, and if he knows that there's a problem with a teacher, that, you know, maybe you shouldn't carry a gun. Maybe he shouldn't be a teacher. Yeah. Uh, I don't disagree with that logic, although I still hold strongly to the opinion that guns in places where there's lots of children is not a good combination. And if the gun is sufficiently (laughs) secure that no child can get to it, then when some guy kicks in the door with an AR-15 spraying bullets around, that teacher's not going to be able to get to the gun anyway, number one. And number two, I've actually been in and on the edges of war zones. I was in Uganda in 1980 during the, during the Civil War with Idi Amin. We took over a, the Numala prison farm. We took over a, a, a refugee center. Uh, a woman that I was working with, a Red Cross worker, and for the Red Cross was shot and killed by a sniper. And I can tell you that when you're under fire... Uh, all bets are off. People people do not make rational decisions. They unless unless they have been under fire a lot, you know, and 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 then they're you look at you know people coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan who've been under fire a lot. They are badly wounded by it themselves. They come back with post traumatic stress disorder. It is. Yeah, I, I I just I can't imagine a Iraq. second grade teacher having the 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 wherewithal to un. Mm. To, to, to take, a, to take a, a concealed weapon out of its appropriately concealed and well-secured place so that when that teacher goes to the bathroom, the kids can't get it, and pulling that gun out and using it against somebody who's just kicked in the door and is spraying bullets around. I just, well, I, you know. <laughs> there are several places that they could keep them on their body that they would be concealed that would not take more than a second to get to, well, as yeah. in the waistband of the back of your pants, as in a leg, holster yeah. down on your ankle that would be covered by pants or then you've got a gun that. where it could conceivably fall to the ground where it could be accidentally discharged where a kid could snatch it as you walk by um it just uh, i think that the cost if you look at it just in the there may be one case where you you know where a a, a, a school shooter is stopped by an armed teacher but, but isn't, the cost isn't benefit that ratio in my mind is not worth it isn't that what Biden said, is if we can save one life? Not if you're going to lose 20 or 30 on the way. Not well, if I'll it, tell you what, is that when an AR-15 is a semi-automatic, most of your handguns are semi-automatic. You can squeeze off bullets just as fast with a handgun than you can with an AR-15. Yeah, you're just I limited by your, by your clip size, them, yeah. by your magazine size. Well, that's right. But guess what? You know how fast you can change a 9mm handgun? Seconds. Well, just Second. just looking over, if you're really good and if you're really fast, yes. Um, looking over just what happened over the last week in Howland Township, Ohio, uh, Edward has been sitting in his home. His sister-in-law Barbara Leary has been house sitting. Boom! A bullet goes through the wall. It was James Carr of Doofus Road told officers he and his step- stepson had been shooting into a pile of wood in the backyard. Um, they didn't realize that the bullet went through this guy's house. Uh, this the next day, Richfield in Minnesota, one weapons offense. Call on June 14th about a 32-year-old intoxicated woman, um, Merced, California. 
I, you know, I, I, I can't, I, these are too long for me to read you all this stuff, but here we have, I have in front of me, in my hot little hands, 48 accidental shootings that happened over the weekend. 48 accidental right. shootings. These are, every single one of these people was a responsible gun owner who thought, ain't never going to happen to me. And out of those 48 accidental shootings, 12 children ages 3, 6, 6, 7, 9, 11, 11, 15, 16, 16, 17, and 17 died. And none of these involved the stereotyped, uh, oh, it must have been gangbangers or that kind of thing. None of them. Okay, wait. Was those shootings, the one that were, was in the backyard where it went into somebody else's house, is that within city limits? Uh, no, it's in Howland Township, firearm. Ohio. I'm guessing it's out in the Doesn't country. The guy's out in the backyard firing a handgun and a shotgun into into a wood pile. He's probably in a more rural area. But uh, not necessarily. A lot of towns and houses have wood piles for fireplaces. You know, yeah. I mean, but within city limits, it's illegal anyway. But you look at Chicago. How many people, name over the, this last weekend, how many people, or the holiday, how many people have got shot there? Yeah, it was, it, yeah, it was, it was a substantial number. That's right. Now, Chicago has gun bans. Yeah, I so, agree. I agree. So Chicago okay, so also has massive inequality between, well, between the rich and the poor. When you look at, and the, and the people who really did the brilliant research on this were Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson, and they wrote two books about it. One's called Why Inequality Matters, and the other's called The Spirit Level. Their website is um, e e e equalitytrust.org.uk. And what they found was that the number of guns is not the highest predictor of gun violence. The availability of guns is not the highest predictor of gun violence. The highest predictor of gun violence is inequality in a society. But those people have every opportunity, just as I... I moved out of my parents' house, and while my parents worked very hard, my dad is a truck driver, my mother is the president of a bank in Colorado, in Denver, mm -hmm. that we were, you know, we had things that we needed. They never gave us everything that we needed, but when I moved out, I was the brokest of broke. I lived off ramen noodles. I opened up those doors, and I walked through them to provide myself what I'm doing today. Yeah, and I'm guessing you're white. Everybody has... Huh? And I'm guessing you're white. That doesn't matter whether I'm white. I'm a truck It actually guy. does. I actually haul, uh, no, I haul oil up in North Dakota. I am the minority up here. Do you know how many women are hauling oil, doing what I'm doing? I've seen two. Yeah. So I am a minority up here. It is 50 to 1 odds of women to men up here. Okay. So I open those doors. I make my, I made my own. You know, I don't put up with anybody's crap of that. I cannot do yeah. this because I'm a woman. But the yeah. fact of the matter is, Brooke, if we want to take our conversation away from the conversation of, you know, should there be guns in schools and will accidents happen, and I think, yes, they will, but you think, no, they won't, we'll respect each other's disagreement. If you want to take that to a discussion of inequality in the United States, what we have seen since Reaganomics is that the wealth of the top 1% has grown to the point where 400 people own more wealth than the other, than, than the bottom half of America. And, and, I mean, just massive wealth inequality, where the average CEO, when I was a kid in the 50s and 60s, made 30 times what their employees made. And these are the well-off CEOs. Uh, I, you know, I lived in a neighborhood where my dad worked in a tool and die shop, and the neighbor behind me was a dentist. You know, those, those things have spread apart. And these, this is a $13,000 house my dad bought in, in, in 56. That is how far it has, you know, our, our society has. And in fact, the, the, the guy I was showing our kids over the weekend, the guy who had the house, two houses down from us, who was the rich guy in the neighborhood because he could afford a garage, he owned the local carpet store. He was a small businessman. And, uh, you know, nowadays it's like it's we are the rich and the poor. We are the rich and the working poor. And the middle class is increasingly vanishing. And this is 32 years of Reaganomics. It's devastating America. And I think that it bears a relationship to why there's that much gun violence in Chicago and other parts of the United States. But, Brooke, I'm, I'm sorry we're out of time. I, I appreciate the, the reasonable and rational conversation. Thank you very much for calling and for listening to Sirius Satellite Radio. We'll talk again, I'm sure. Thanks for the call. We'll be back.